Okay, everybody, this is going to be our last lecture on just proving our hermeneutical rules to you. And uh, then by next lecture, we're going to be able to move right into um, analyzing the passage of Scripture that I wanted to take you through in terms of the applying of the hermeneutical rules, which then, you know, as I've already said, that then is the exegesis, okay? Applying the hermeneutical, hermene hermeneutical rules to um, the passages of Scripture. And then hopefully then they're going to get a lot of repetition on the, the rules because we're going to be actually utilizing them. And so now what we're at, let me grab a hold of this real quickly. We are on rule number six. And rule number six says, there must be at least two or three witnesses that establish a tr to establish a truth. And the best place for us to start with that particular, uh, proving that particular rule, that that is indeed the rule defined by the Bible. Uh, we can start right here in John chapter 8, verse 18. Jesus said, I am one that bears witness of myself, and the Father that sent me, he bears witness of me. So let's just back up a little bit uh, from that. And uh, we can go to verse 16. He says, uh, let's go back to actually go on back to verse 15. He says, you judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true for I am not alone. In other words, he's saying, we got, I got two witnesses here, but I am the father that has sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of, uh, of two men is true. So once again, he's bringing back uh, he's bringing us back to the uh, Old Testament definition of the, the necess necessity of having two or three witnesses to establish any truth, to validate any witness. And he goes on, he says, I am one uh, that bears witness of myself and the father that sent me, he bears witness of me. Then said they unto him, where is your father? And Jesus answered, you neither know my father uh, you neither know me nor my father. If you had known me, you should have also known my father. But the bottom line of it is, here we are. Jesus is setting up the rules. Now let's go and uh, and and move forward with this to a next our next verse of scripture. Truth. Um, let's go to John chapter five and verse thirty one. Let's look there again. He says, "If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that bears witness of me." And I know that witness which he witnesses of me is true. And then, of course, he goes on to say, um, you sent unto John, he bore witness unto the truth. Jesus, of course, being the truth, and bore witness unto him. He says, but I, I don't need or receive the testimony from man. But these, th these things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in that light. But I have a greater witness. Jesus is, you know, emphasizing the need for two or three witnesses. Once again, I have a greater witness than that which John could give me. And the greater witness that Jesus had was the works which the Father had given him to finish. He said, the same works I do, and they bear witness of me. And what, what those works were, of course, Jesus then expounds on them even more. Later on in John chapter 14, it was the miracles, the signs, and the wonders that was bearing witness, which he then said, this is the Father doing it. And not only that, you know, as we've already said, he said, search the scriptures for they are they that testify of me. Um, of course, Jesus, once again, when he, when he was exegeting, if you would, with the disciples, he took them uh, on the road to Emmaus. He expounded what was written in uh, by Moses and the law and in the prophets. So, um, you know, once again, to establish what Jesus was going to say, he went to the word of God to establish it. Should be a very, very important lesson for all of us. Uh, when Jesus was going to say something, um, he basically quoted the scripture. You can see it in the 40 uh, days of being um, tempted by the devil. Jesus takes, just takes up Deuteronomy. And many more things to say about that, but moving right along, trying to stick with um the program here, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, Paul says it very, very strong. Uh, and once again, this would certainly be again an application uh, of doctrine. And he says, this is the third time that I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Shall every word be established? I told you before, I foretell you as I were, as I, if, 
as if I were present the second time. And being absent now, I write to them being absent now. Let me just get the whole thing here. Um, being absent now, I write to them which uh, up until this point have sinned and to all others that I that if I come again, I will not spare since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. Um, once again, and, and I'm going to make a point of this here in just a minute, we're not going to just take one thing that Paul said because you don't have to. Um, he says he says it over and again. What he said to the church at Ephesus, he also says to the church at Corinth. You can understand more about what he's saying to the church at Ephesus, but I understand what he said to the church at Corinth. It's really the same subject. They're parallel. You can understand many things that Paul says um, in uh, Romans chapter 5, uh, Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 4, but what he said to the church at Galatia, because it brings in the whole picture. It's the same person speaking, and I could, we could give you many examples where it actually may seem contradictory, but it's not contradictory. And what really helps us to establish that much more is it's the same uh, apostle that the Lord is using. And of course, we know, once again, uh, establishing authorship and establishing authority is all within the framework that this is God speaking and it's his authority and what's happening, whether it's the Apostle Paul or Isaiah or <clears throat> who it is, they are speaking directly by God. Or let me just say this, if it's God incarnate, Christ Jesus himself, once again, they are speaking by divine authority. It isn't kind of the word of God. It is exactly the word of God. So that as I have said before, Paul was able to say then, um, if an angel speaks anything different to you or tells you anything different than what I've said, let him be a curse. That carries with it <laughs> a very strong argument of this is divine revelation exactly like God the Father wants to say it and it's intended to say, don't change it, don't add to it, don't take away from it. So, uh, many more things to say about that, but there are many doctrines in the church right now that if everyone or the people especially who are the leaders of propagating those doctrines would listen to the whole counsel of Paul on a subject, then they wouldn't have the doctrines that they have. And oh, I can list many, many doctrines that are completely taken out of context. Uh, the faith of Abraham is taken out of context over and over again. If you want to understand the faith of Abraham that Paul was talking about, then go back and read Genesis and understand how faithful Abraham was to walk in all of God's commandments and his ordinances and his statutes. Um, look at how faithful Abraham was to follow God and, and walk with God when he left everything that was familiar to him, that was safe, to go and follow the Lord leading him into a place that he had never been before, uh, that Hebrews 11, uh, for example, expands, expands upon. So we can't just take an isolated verse of scripture and say, oh, this is what that means. That would be entire, that's entirely wrong. We listen to the verse of scripture, we say, what does this mean? Then we go everywhere we possibly can and we gather information on this exact same topic. If, if Paul is talking about Abraham, then we go back and we, we read about Abraham. We read about who he was and what he did. And, and we not only just listen to what, he, what Paul said about Abraham and the faith of Abraham to the Romans, we also listen to what he said about Abraham and the faith of Abraham in, in uh, Galatians. And we don't just parcel it out because suddenly, you know, we can relate to it more. We gotta have the whole counsel of God. We want two or three witnesses to establish every truth. And so, um, you know, Jesus is going to say the same thing in Matthew 18, 16, but it's going to be a different context. Of course, if you turn to Matthew 18, 16, you're going to discover there that if, you know, your brother has a problem with you, then go to your brother, you know, try to be reconciled with your brother. If he hears you, then you've gained a brother. Okay. But if he won't hear you, then what you're supposed to do is take two or three witnesses with you so that. You know, the, what was right and proper for you to do, and that is to be reconciled to your brother, can be established. No, he really did it. He went after to 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 make this right. 
and it's established in the mouth of two or three witnesses because no one witness is ever going to be accepted in the court of justice. In the divine court, it's not going to be accepted. And so what's going to happen then, and of course, when you have two or three witnesses there, it's going to, it's going to bring insight, right? Two or three witnesses, they're sitting there. They can say, hey, you know what? You, you've got a wrong approach here. You're just being defensive. You're, you're provoking uh, this person, not trying to <laughs> be reconciled. And so those additional witnesses then are going to help you with your blind spots. It's going to help you with the wrong approach. It's a great context. Spend more time with it. Look at it. Then when you look at Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 6, Deuteronomy 19.15, once again, it's be, it, the same thing is being said. The context there is that, you know, you can't bring any charge against anyone. You can't say that someone said something, did something, unless there are two or three witnesses. You can't accuse them of having done the deed, okay? Well, how much more should that then be established for the father? You can't accuse the father of having done the deed or said the thing, unless there are two or three witnesses and he does indeed give them to us because once again, I'm going to say this at the expense of a lot of redundancy, the Bible is a book to us from the Father about redemption and he's making the point over and over and over again and so we shouldn't be going off on all these other tangents. It should all lead into testifying of Christ Jesus, our redemption, what it means to walk with God. Jesus said, Behold, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. And so once again, we that's Hebrews. He said it in he he said the same thing uh, in Matthew. Search the scriptures for in them you think you have salvation, and they are they which testify of me. Okay, so let's quickly look at 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 19. And here it's really very similar. Um, you can't bring an accusation against an elder except you have two or three witnesses. Against an elder, bring receive no accusation but before two or three witnesses. Well, <laughs> don't receive an accusation against father that he said something uh, and that this, this is what he wants of our life and this is who he is and this is how it works. There are so many things uh, said about the omnipotence of God that are not true. It, they don't stick with the word of God. And there's so many things said about the omniscience of God that are not true. People don't stick with the word of God. They get off into philosophical ideas and um, and so on. There are so many places and you know, at this point in time, I don't want to lose everybody because I'm talking about your favorite doctrine. I'm not limiting God in any way. And and we understand what the scripture does say uh, about, for example, those two subjects, omnipotence and omniscience of God. Let's keep them in context. Let's understand the whole counsel of God, not just some piece or some part of it. Because what happens is people want to make, you know, for example, the omniscience of God, you know, uh, just based on what the psalmist said. But you've got to also understand the omnipotence of God based upon the revelation of Abraham in, in Genesis chapter 18. Okay, the omniscience of God based on Genesis chapter 18. You've got to also understand the omniscience of God based upon the revelation uh, of God to um, Moses and, and on Mount Sinai in um, uh, Exodus chapter 33 and 34. So we've got to take the whole counsel of God, not just part of it. And, and so let's bring in all the information and not say, well, I don't believe that, or this is the way it is, or uh, we got to, you know, this is allegorical or symbolic. When it's not, when you read Deuteronomy, or forgive me, when you read Exodus chapter 33 and 34, that's not symbolic. That is a literal event. It's a narrative. It's a literal event. It's not a parable. Um, it, it's not poetry. <laughs> it, it's not prophecy. There is absolutely no argument. So it's the same with Genesis chapter 18. If people would begin to define who God is, for example, on Genesis chapter 18, and um, just take, um, for example, uh, as I was saying, Exodus 33 and 34, 
there's going to be an entirely different revelation. And you couple that with the fact that in Genesis chapter one and two, we were made the image of the likeness of God. And you can't just make, you can't just spiritualize that simply because you, you believe something existential about God. Uh, you have to take in the whole counsel. Yes, I understand Isaiah 66, and it's a very important, it's a, it would be a great example of a passage of scripture that we ought to exegete because, you know, the Lord's telling us that the heavens of heaven can't contain him, okay? Where are you going to make a place for him to dwell? To understand that in the context of Stephen said that God doesn't dwell in temples made by hands. To understand what Paul, Paul said in Acts 17, um, God doesn't dwell in a, a, a temple made with hands. Yet to understand that God did come into the, this tent that the Lord had designed for um, Moses to make for him into the holies of holies. He was seen there also um, in uh, the the temple and tabernacle that that was built for him by Solomon. But he's not contained there. He's not he's not a little god that you set up in a room and the only place he is is in that little room. And if you're going to visit God, you got to go to that little room. I mean, he, you know, fathers he has no limitations. So. Just, just that many more examples of, of two or three witnesses, context, the whole counsel of God, taking every um, verse of scripture, every bit of information that we have on the subject and bringing it to bear. And so um, let's real quickly uh, look also at Hebrews 10, 28, and then try to move through the rest of these because this is the last lecture I'm giving to proving the hermeneutical rules. I, it's well, well, it's really saying the same thing as what was already established in the Old Testament. Now it's brought over into the New Testament um, as well. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. It didn't matter what it was. If it was adultery, there had to be two or three witnesses before you were going to be charged. I mean, come on, that's good. The goodness of God, the grace of God, the, the rule of God, that is his rule. That is rule, his, God's rule of evidence. Understand that. Once again, there are many more verses of Scripture on this, but it is absolutely, and I hope that you can appreciate this, two or three witness, it, witnesses are God's rule of evidence. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. In 1 Corinthians 15, 29, there's something that theologically we call an ad hominem, and this ad hominem, uh, uh, hominem is um, uh, an argument based upon something that people uh, uh, believe or said, but it's not it's not true. It's just an argument. I mean, for example, 1 Corinthians 15, 29, Paul is referring to telling the church of Corinth, which I believe is not something necessarily that they were practicing, but something that they had practiced before or that was being practiced around them or that somehow they were believing that was being espoused to them by someone else because it's certainly not true. He's saying, he's arguing with them. Listen, if you're baptized, he's telling them about the resurrection from the dead and the issue of there's some that are already talking about that the resurrection has already passed. And he's saying to them, look, wait a minute, hold up. And he's explaining to them the resurrection. And he says, wait, if you're being baptized for the dead, okay, all about being raised up for the dead, and the dead raised not, then what, what value does it have to be baptized for the dead? Is Paul speaking about a doctrine that somehow... Um, the living can go get baptized for the dead or the limit and, and the dead then can be a part of the first resurrection that somehow or other <laughs> we can, you know, vicariously or representatively rather uh, be someone else's salvation that's already died. In other words, your great grandfather died and you're not sure if he was saved. So you go get baptized for him to make sure that he makes heaven. Of course, he's not saying that. He's definitely not saying that. Okay. And, so, and once again, <clears throat> this is a Bible, a book about, uh, it is about a book about redemption. And so we're going to hear it over and over and over again. It, it is essential uh, to what, to salvation, if it's what Father's purpose for us, if it's what, it, what he's willed for us to do, if it's supposed to be doctrines of the church, there is no way you can make this a doctrine of the church. And Paul would have talked about it elsewhere if it were. And then we can go on and we can talk about Matthew 12, 27, where, you know, the, the Jews are saying, ah, you know, he cast out devils by the prince of devils. And Jesus says, hold up, you know. And he says, he's arguing, if Beelzebub cast, Beelzebub cast out devils, he said, if it's the prince of devils could cast out devils, 
then how do your children cast it out? And if a house divided by against itself, uh, if a house is divided against itself, how can it stand? I mean, so, you know, it, for somehow, for some person to come along and say, well, you know, Satan can cast out devils based upon this particular arc type of argument that was being used by Jesus to shut these guys down on, on what they were saying and perhaps even some of what they were actually believing. Then we're going to make a doctrine out of that. Well, that would be just ridiculous because we would hear it uh, certainly over and again. Then let's, let's move on quickly to rule number seven. And rule number seven says you cannot violate the context of the scripture to establish a truth. And so uh, let me just say what this means. First, we must not obscure the meaning of any passage of scripture by removing its relationship to God, who is no respecter of person and who is unchanging in his nature and his judgments. Yet there is a near con. Okay, so what we do is we understand this. There is a near context to a single word and that near context is a sentence, and that near context of the sentence is a paragraph, and that near context of the paragraph is a section, and that near context uh, to the section is the book, and finally there's the entirety of the Bible, okay? So uh, we understand the meaning of the word by the way that it is used elsewhere in Scripture. I've said it over and again, let's not violate context, but let's not violate definitions either. So let's understand that if we're really going to grab a hold of context, if we're really going to understand the meaning of a verse of scripture, then what we're going to do is we're going to start off with getting a hold of the word of God and understanding exactly what the single word means from the scripture. And yeah, this is going to take time. And then we're going to then more fully understand what the verse of scripture is saying. And then we're not just going to pull a verse of scripture out of the context and apply it in a context that it, it, it doesn't necessarily apply to. Um, one of the things that I just gave, if, if you know, Jesus making an argument that Beelzebub could cast out devils. Okay, hold up just a second. Somebody might argue said and say, well, you know, Jesus said in uh, Matthew chapter seven, you know, depart from me, um, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And that was in a situation in which there were those who were saying, we have cast out devils in your name. And um, then someone's going to argue, see, they didn't know God. And so they were casting out devils by the, the prince of devils. So really, Satan can cast out other devils when it serves his interest. Ooh, that would be really a stretch, wouldn't it? That would be a stretch because, number one, they're, they're missing something that's very important. And that is the authority of the name of Jesus. And the authority of the name of Jesus by itself could be all that is necessary then and is needed no matter who it is. The authority of the name of Jesus is so powerful and so authoritative that a devil would go out of someone else when the authority of that name is being invoked, even if that person didn't know uh, God and wasn't right with God. I mean, that is a possibility. So you can't take a verse of scripture that has a number of different possibilities that's almost like, you know, in that particular context, a little bit more difficult to even discern and now try to apply that to another obscure verse of scripture where uh, this particular type of uh, ad hominem argument is being used and then say, oh, here we go. Um, I have established a truth. Well, that it just, just doesn't work that way, okay? And, and you know, also we're going to, as I've said over and again, we're going to be very, very sensitive uh, to historical context um, and, uh, you know, which will allow us to, to, to uh, glean greater insights. And uh, we're going to recognize that in some special instances, um, we do need, uh, to, you know, this additional information, if you would, to some degree, to some degree only. Do I necessarily need to know secular history, really, uh, in order to understand the book of Daniel? Not, uh, not entirely, because Daniel does give to us the list of nations that he's referring to. I might understand more about the Babylonian Empire, or maybe I'll understand more about the Medio Persian Empire or the Alexandrian Empire or the Roman Empire because I went and I studied historical information. But that doesn't in any way um, 
do away with the reality that I would have had enough information then to utilize the symbols and the interpretation of the symbols to more fully understand the book of Revelation. So I hope you get that. And let me quickly go through the last two uh, points, number eight, nine, and 10, last three points, uh, number eight, number nine, and number 10, and then we can just wrap this up. And hopefully you will pre appreciate that our rules uh, make a lot of sense from a biblical perspective and that they are really the rules that the Lord has um, established for us uh, in the Bible itself. Okay, rule number eight. Um, so we just finished with seven. Rule number eight, um, the conclusions that we derive must not contradict other scriptures. And, and we say this because this is going on all the time where people will take a case in point and say, well, you know, this is true. And then all of a sudden they're over in another section of the Bible. Maybe it's Romans. And now all of a sudden they go to Galatians. And with the things that they said concerning um, some particular information that they were given suddenly it runs contradictory to what's being said in Galatians. So wait a minute, you know, hold up what's being said. It's not, there's not a contradiction. Um, so if you're reading and you think that God, for example, dwells in, in the temple and that's, then you read and, and um, say, let's just say you read that in Exodus or you read that in Leviticus or you read that in Numbers or you read that in um, First Kings uh, wherever this, or First Samuel, uh, forgive me, Second Samuel, that'd be the best place, uh, possibly First Kings too. Um, and then all of a sudden you read where Stephen says, the Lord doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Well, there's no contradiction there, but if you derive some kind of unique ideas about God dwelling in the temple, um, just in exclusion of what Stephen said in Acts chapter uh, seven and what Paul said in Acts chapter 17, um, then all of a sudden you're running up against a contradiction. There's a lot of other, you know, probably better examples even than I could give than that of where people are constantly finding supposed contradictions. No, there is no contradiction. You just have a wrong conclusion about what you were reading. Now what's happened is you brought in more of the whole counsel of God and it's going to have, now you're going to have to stand back and you're going to have to consider how two things that seem to be contrary to one another, how that they're not contrary to one another. And the basis of that is that it's one author and the author is not confused. The basis of that is that you believe that there is one author, God, that his word is accurate, that he knows what he's talking about, that he's not changing his mind. And so as a result, then you back up and you begin to listen to the whole counsel of God and you begin to understand, oh, okay, yes, the Lord made a place to meet with Israel in the holies of holies, in the tent uh, that was in the wilderness, but he doesn't, he's not confined to that area. Uh, you know, the foreign gods, of the nations, they would take their little idol, they would set it up in a room, okay? And they would, you know, God dwelt in that room. He dwelt in that house. And if you wanted to worship that God, you had to go to that house because that's where he was. Well, God said, I'm not there. He, he, he can't contain me. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Not to say that he, his presence wasn't there um, in, in the holies of holies when Israel was walking right with them. He was, it wasn't that he was not dwelling in their midst, for he certainly was, However, he wasn't contained there. He wasn't limited there. And so there's more to say about that, but I just hope in, in brief, and I'll bring these things out more as we go along, as we begin to do um, an exegesis uh, and apply our hermeneutical rules, rules to Acts chapter 8, verse uh, 15. So there's, uh, once again, the Bible is a divine book. It has a singular authorship. The sovereign almighty God will not contradict himself. So if you're running into contradictions, once again, it, that is because you haven't considered the whole, all, the whole of the information before you derived your conclusion. And you haven't really understood uh, certain simple things um, that was being presented by what was said. 
And so that's where we back up. We get, begin to understand that a little bit more. We do, you know, we, we begin to do research on the words. What do these words really mean? We look at our context a little bit better. We bring in more scriptures on the subject. Suddenly we begin to get a more broader view then of the whole counsel of God and what God is specifically saying on any given point. Okay, number nine. Doctrine must be derived from what the scripture definitely teaches and not what might be inferred. And one of these things is simply this. Um, we have a classical sta statement that we make theologically. It says you cannot argue from silence. You can't try to tell me, for example, about Peter's family life. Uh, because the scripture doesn't say anything about his family life after Pentecost. So somebody would say, would say well, because, you know, uh, there's no more mention of Peter with his wife and with his family. Evidently, he left his family and no longer had a family life. You can't say that. The Bible doesn't specifically say that. So you don't want to try to then play make believe or fill in the blanks or discuss things that have not been clearly revealed we don't want to try to second guess god we don't want to go with what we think the text is saying or what it might be implying or inferring we want to go with exactly what it says and then leave it there somebody says what was peter's family life like after pentecost I can't tell you. <laughs> One guess is as good as a, as good as the other. You know, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I had a, 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 a one of our professors um, in history was uh, also an attorney, and he really spent a lot of time talking to us about how much of the news and much of the information that we receive is based upon um, basically. Uh, 1% fact, somewhere between 1% and 10% fact, but usually closer to 1% fact or truth. And then there is the rest of it, you know, uh, maybe 9 to 10% of it, uh, you know, is what that fact infers. And then the rest of it, you know, usually 80 to 90%, um, is the opinion of the person who's actually doing the writing. And so we had to spend a lot of time analyzing this from a historical point of view, but first just looking at our situation as we stand right now in the in the paper, in Time magazine, you know, the news in general, saying being able to parse that out, how much of that is actual fact, how much of it is inferred. This is this is what we infer from that, okay? Uh, the president walked across the lawn. That was the fact. Then all the inference um, that they would put on him walking across the, the the lawn. What does that infer, you know, that he was doing? And then their opinion about why he walked across the lawn. And so we, we got to make sure that we're not doing that with the Bible. Let's stick with exactly what the Bible says and leave it there. And, you know, there are some hard things to understand. You know, when we start off in, in Genesis chapter 6 and we hear that the sons of God knew the daughters of men and they produced giants. Famous men, ancient famous men became men of legend. We kind of just accept it for what it says and not try to infer something, make it an allegory that's narrative. And then you know, in the end, it's hard to understand. And then, then all of a sudden people are going to say, people are going to start saying, oh, the sons of God or yada, yada. And, you know, the sons and the daughters of men are this and hold up, you know, it, really those arguments don't hold water. I don't want to go through that, but we go on and we read and continually reading. We find out that there is a lot of information on the subject. It's hard to deal with because it's so foreign to our culture and what's easy for us to receive and preformed ideas about angels and, and preformed ideas, you know, that we have about even in that case, sexuality. And so uh, we just got to just let the Bible speak for itself. And if we don't like it, well, then 
too bad. <laughs> but don't make it say something different than what is said, okay? And so the number nine is doctrine must be derived from what scripture definitely teaches and not what might be inferred. Okay, so also we must become aware that we are not uh, forming an idea based upon silence, as I said, okay? Um, you know, and, and another good uh, point here is uh, misunderstanding, for example, is something that is plainly declared um, where Jesus said, if you will receive this, we know that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, okay? He had mannerism like Elijah. He had behavior like Elijah. He didn't do miracles like Elijah. He just preached. You know, there was a Holy Ghost conviction in his preaching. There wasn't miracles. He didn't need miracles. Okay, so, uh, but there were similarities to, to, uh, to Elijah. He, he was the messenger of the Lord that came to prepare the way of the Lord for the Lord Jesus' first coming. Well, Elijah is going to come and prepare the way of the Lord, as Malachi says, uh, for Christ Jesus' uh, second coming. And, um, you know, so then, you know, Jesus said, if you receive this, this is Elijah that was that was to come. Now, somebody takes that verse of scripture, if, they'll ta if they take that, uh, Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, um, I believe it is. Let's just go over there real quickly. Uh, it's just a classic example of where, I mean, people have really gone off, okay, and and, and off the deep end, okay, uh, Matthew eleven fourteen, and if they would have simply followed the rules uh, that we've already laid out in hermeneutics, uh, they would have never ended up in, in this uh, ridiculous place. Matthew eleven fourteen, and uh, let's see, did I get it? Uh, no, I didn't get it. I didn't. I didn't put it down right. But at any rate, uh, I'll, I'll put that up here here on the screen for you here in just a minute. Uh, where did, where did I go wrong with that? But nonetheless, well, I could just I could just type it into the search engine. Everybody's hopefully has a search engine, and you could just type in Elijah. Okay, we want to get all the information we can on Elijah, especially when we're going to try to begin to um, understand. A, 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 a verse of scripture like this and of course uh, if you're doing it from a New Testament point of view you would have to do Elias okay and let's see if I can bring this up real quick and it is um, here we go search through these verses of scripture we'll get it here in a minute go all the way to the New Testament as soon as I can get my wonderful search engine program that seems to be having troubles to work properly. We'll get her here in a minute. Wow, my computer is going very, very slow right now. It happens. And here, let's get to it. See if we can get to it now. Well, let me just bring that up on the screen here just a little bit and, and just re refer to it for right now. Forgive me for not uh, actually having the reference right. But nonetheless, um, Jesus said this was, if you receive it, this was Elias who, or Elijah who was to come. And so somebody says, see, John was Elijah, therefore reincarnation must be valid. Well, you talk about jumping to a conclusion. Yeah, well, here he is. He's been born. Elijah existed. Well, if you would have taken the whole counsel of God in it, you would have certainly never jumped to that conclusion. And you might say, well, that's ridiculous and odd. Believe me, there are a number of people, there are a lot of people who believe that. And, um, you know, I can go on and on with examples. I've dealt with a lot of different ideas in my 36 years of pastoring. And then, of course, my dad was a minister, so I was constantly in church, raised around a lot of different ideas and concepts about God and about the Bible. And so I've heard a lot of different things. But if they had just gone back and recognized, wait a minute, Elijah didn't die. He went up and he went up into heaven alive and he's alive in heaven right now. So there isn't a possibility of there being reincarnation, okay? If they would have simply taken the whole counsel of God, they would have recognized that he was never incarnated either. So that's that can't be true. And that in reality of it is, is that Elijah himself 
will actually one day return, and we can see them in the book of Revelation, and that's not allegory. That's part of narrative. See, people say you can't take prophecy that way. Well, you know, you can take prophecy that way. God is delivering a message to us about what's going to happen in the future, and it's not going to be something that is obscured and no one can understand it. That would be ridiculous. What meaning or value is there in any communication that somehow you can't understand? And the, once again, the Lord didn't just give this for just, you know, one or two people to understand. And we all got to listen to what they got from God because it doesn't work that way. The priesthood of the believer is absolutely intact. And, you know, I say that just based upon the Reformation but it's just simply that we're sons of God. God. It's a message that God has given not only to us, but all the world, anyone who will hear. So it's an understandable, easily, easy to understand uh, message. So let's go on now to rule number 10. And um, and I think, you know, I, I think I want to go ahead and, and I think I've already done this, actually put in rule number 11 as well. But let's quickly get number 10. The Bible must be received Oh, let me say this too, because just on the whole um, doctrine of the ultimate reconciliation of all things, you know, I'm not trying to pick on everybody's doctrine, but I am going to pick on the worst ones, okay? This idea that everybody's going to be saved, including Satan himself. Look, it, you can't just take Colossians 1.20 and say God reconciled all things unto himself, and therefore, because he's reconciled all things unto himself, that he's actually also reconciled Satan and the fallen angels I mean, come on, you know, if you will continue to read the whole counsel of God, you're going to discover that Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years. And after that, he, the false prophet, the, the Antichrist, and, and every, you know, angel of darkness is going to be cast into the lake of fire. So, you know, once again, taking the whole counsel of God is absolutely essential before you jump to a conclusion. So... You have to understand God reconciled all things to himself in the sense that the Bible proclaims that all to be. And you're, and so therefore, you know, if you start trying to write someone in that like Satan, then you're going to have a definite proof, not some kind of inference that you come up with from a few, few abstract or obscure scriptures. And then when it's very plain that Satan's damnation is absolutely sealed and it is eternal, there's no way then that you're going to end up with such a doctrinal idea. The only way you can come up with these crazy doctrines is simply that you didn't follow the rules. And then the way, the only way that you come up with even doctrines that the Bible doesn't clearly teach that so many people espouse in so many different denominations because it's built upon a revelation that some man got. Well, listen, if we can't all see that revelation plainly from what God's word says, then let's stay away from that because there's too much that God has plainly revealed for us to be doing and, and for us to be presenting instead of getting off on, on these other topics. I went by a sign um, yesterday on the road. said, everybody who worships God on Sunday is taking the mark of the beast because it was a group of seven-day Adventists who want to make it that, you know, keeping the Sabbath is absolutely essential in terms of worshiping only on Saturday, they refuse to look at the fact that Jesus rose up from the dead on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. They refuse to look at the fact that Paul talks about on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, let the collections be made when you come and, and join yourself together. All the historical evidence that the church worshiped on the first day of the, of the week, always, once again, celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it was. It was a continual ongoing celebration of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They continue to be unwilling to, to bring in the whole counsel of God on the, on the reality that Christ Jesus brought this rest. He is the rest. And he brought this sabbatical rest, this Sabbath to our lives in, in, in salvation. He is the rest. And, you know, some people want to go on Saturday. Some people want to go on Sunday. I say you should go every day. Okay. And, you know, that's, you know, we're supposed to assemble ourselves all the more together. 
as the day approaches. And I don't have anything against anybody worshiping the Lord on Saturday. But then when you point the finger and say that anybody worships the Lord on Sunday, they're taking the mark of the beast or it was Sunday was started by the Antichrist. Honestly, you know, I go through some strange areas in America. There's a sign that said the Antichrist. Once again, it's seven day Adventists wanting to create a fight. I love the seven day Adventists. Bless you. But I mean, you got some of the people that are in your denomination that are doing some wild things, saying that the Antichrist started worship on Sunday. Well, that's just ridiculous. You know, show me in the scripture where it says that. It, it, it's something you inferred and at the exclusion of understanding what the Sabbath is all about, at the exclusion of recognizing that Christ Jesus brought Sabbath to us, that we have entered into Sabbath, the rest of the Lord, okay, that Father has completed his work of redemption through Christ Jesus. You fail to realize all the things that are attached to Sunday, the first day of the week. Once again, if you want to worship on Saturday, that's fine. And, and clearly, I mean, my goodness, that is a long tradition. No problem. But you can't create a whole theology and then, and, and then even worse, a condemnation theology based on something that you inferred that the Bible never even said. Okay, so enough said about that. Um, going on to rule number 10. There's many more things. I can pick on your favorite denomination too. I promise you the Seventh-day Adventist or the Roman Catholic Church has no corner on the market of false doctrines of doctrines of men and even doctrines of devils. And I know this doesn't go over very well, but in every denomination, you can see those doctrines and those traditions and those ideas that are propagated by the denominations that are not the word of God. It's not the revelation of the word of God. It's the ideas of men. It's the things they chose to believe about God. It's things that they distilled. And I don't care if you're a Pentecostal, Assemblies of God, a Methodist, a Presbyterian. We can find things that once again come out of tradition and out of philosophy that have been integrated into the doctrinal ideas and then propagated in, in the school system, in the teaching system, in you know uh, the weeklies, in the monthlies, in the journals and whatnot. So, okay, enough of that real quickly. Let me try to finish this up. The Bible must be received and understood in a literal sense. And if you can't take it in a literal sense, then you know what? There is no revealed truth. The Holy Ghost has come to lead us and to guide us in all truth. God says, my word is truth. And as I've laid out the foundation, he's made us a plain revelation to men so that we might know his will. Yes, his word is spirit in his life, but it is literal. It's sensible. It is a message for you and I to receive and do that, that Jesus said, you know, that number one, <laughs> the hearers are not justified. Okay. It's, it's about doing, it's not, it's not just those who hear it. Th it's those who do. Okay. Uh, that obey him. And, um, and of course, Jesus, Jesus said that also by a servant, James, and, 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 and we can talk about other verses of scripture also. Now it is God's revelation to us. It's his will and his purpose for our life. It's spoken in simple human language. Um, he, he it, it's, you know, um, I think, I think this verse of scripture is correct. You know, I wrote down a bunch of scriptures in a, in a hurry here. So let me make sure that, um, yeah, Matthew eleven twenty five. I know I've said this before. Let me say it again. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Lord, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and you have revealed them unto babes. Okay, even so, it, Father, it, it seemed it seemed good in your in your sight. So if there were a category of people, uh, a special category of people that could understand the, the word of God, it's the simple. It's like those who with childlike um, simplicity hear what is being said in the word of God. And so number one, you have to have a strong argument and that is clearly substantiated by everyone who's looking at it uh, to say, we can't take this literal. We have to understand this is allegorical. And, um, you know, we can't understand the person of uh, Satan or Lucifer, <clears throat> the devil, as a dragon with seven heads and um, ten horns. We have to understand that is symbolic of him at who drew the stars of heaven, okay? One third of the stars. We got to understand what is a symbolic meaning, okay? 
Um, what is this uh, uh, symbolic meaning, meaning of the moon and the stars? I mean, forgive me, the moon and the sun, okay? And um, the, these and these 11 stars uh, that uh, of, of, the, of jo Joseph's uh, vision is also repeated then in a revelation of the sun clothed woman. Obviously there is symbolism there. There is a literal declaration of the simple word of God. And then there's symbolism that we've got to understand. And I'm going to tell you, the Bible gives us the key to understanding the symbolism. We do not have to look outside of the Bible to understand that symbolism. It's there, it's revealed. And so you're going to have to listen to the whole counsel of God so that it can be revealed to you. And hopefully your teachers, your preachers, your ministers are not just disciples of men propagating the ideas of men. And now that's what you believe. And you say the Bible believes that. And you only think the Bible says that. And you believe that simply because some man told you. Well, we want to give you the ability to study that thing out yourself and be honest and true and ethical about the thing. Be Berean, as I've said before, and see, does the Bible really say that? And understand that, once again, every symbol in the Bible that is used is interpreted by the Bible, as well as, is just like it is with the parables, so it is with all prophetic symbols. If I had time right now to take you through example after example, I would. Uh, you'll have to see me some other time, and I'd be happy to do that. Um, so, once again, we're sensitive to, to allegory, allegory and symbolism. And the Bible itself uh, interpreted, interprets it, so that's why, you know, we have a sensitivity to genre and, you know, uh, understand uh, uh, what is allegory, so, or figurative language, okay? Okay, so, let me, I'm just making some edited notes while I'm doing this. Then the last one is living to see. I, I think I want to try to put in here, narrative speech is used in poetry, and all, uh, just talk about narrative speech for just a minute. And, and understand the, the meaning of narrative speech, which is, once again, absolutely to be taken literal. It's used in poetry. It's also used in symbolism, which is used, which is also in, in pro, used in prophecy. And the literal nature of narrative history uh, that is found in the prophets and the writings have got to be understood and separated out, if need be, from anything that's going on allegorical. And actually, you understand the allegorical by the literal. You understand the symbolic by the literal narrative. Once again, there are many examples of that. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's, we, uh, we need to understand the natural, we need to under, uh, appreciate um, uh, the literal meaning of the allegorical usage, for example, of wings uh, that are associated with God. Uh, we can't say, well, God has wings. And, you know, uh, if we wait on him, we're going to get wings as well. Um, you know, <laughs> we can understand the value of that in terms of how an eagle takes a, on herself um, her young and then she mounts up and flies with her, uh, um, you know, younglings or chicklings or whatever you want to call call them her young eagles <laughs> riding on her wings she's the one who's doing the flying and so it's poetical um and there is a you know a literal allegory the allegory that is being used that everybody can understand the meaning of that when jesus said how often would i've gathered you under he says to jerusalem how often would i have gathered you under my wings you know as a hen gathers her brood, but you would not. How often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chickens, her chicklings, her brood, under her wings rather, but you would not. And we understand the value and the meaning of what's being said. It's similar then, the same application is similar then to what is being said um, uh, with respect to, you know, we'll mount up with wings. We wait upon the Lord, we'll run, not be weary. There's a literal meaning there, okay? But it's still, it's allegorical. But the spiritual application of the literal meaning that we can derive from that is supposed to be appreciated and valued. And I probably didn't do a really good job of helping you understand what I'm trying to say with this particular um, argument um, or, uh, or hermeneutical rule. It's just emphasizing the literalness of the message. And so, you know, that is actually was part of rule number 10. I try to start breaking it out. And so I'll try to do a little bit of jo better job for it and publish that for you. 
And so we love all of you very much. Thank you for watching this. Be blessed in Jesus' name.